continuing our survey of the eukaryotic pathogens, Chapter 12, Part C is devoted to the protozoa. When we talk about the protozoa, these are going to be differentiated by often the forms that are going to inhabit a, a host. So we'll talk about some of the characteristics of the various phyla and look at what are the defining features. The protozoa as a group, again, are often put into this kingdom of proteases that are going to be similar to single-celled algae and often found in common environments. But when we talk about the protozoa, these are going to all be unicellular. They are chemoheterotrophs and they have an absorptive lifestyle, which is what we see as the progression in the eukaryotes, but they're also the beginning of ingestion. So we see the cytostome or the primitive mouth evolving with these protozoa. They often have a gullet that is going to allow food to be moved into some sort of a vacuole and then put into an anal pore and released. They are defined often by the type of motility that they have and many of them form spore or cysts rather to be able to survive adverse conditions. So again, characteristic features, we'll look at the various types of motility and we'll see that for adverse survival or survival through adverse conditions, many of these are going to form cysts because they're usually in aquatic environments or with water. And then we see that as those conditions change, cysts are going to be a way for it to survive. The protozoan means first animal. So even though they don't look like an animal, they actually function very much like one. So we'll see how complete these are in the sense that they are going to start to ingest food, put it into a vacuole for digesting, and then spew it back out into the environment as waste via an anal pore. They inhabit water and soil and are all around us they're often even normal microbiota, both of us and other animals. There's over 20,000 species, but relatively few actually cause disease. And you see some of the free living ones that you're familiar with, things like paramecium and amoeba. These are common ones that are found just in about any drop of water that you take a look at. The protozoa are going to be chemoheterotrophs. Again, they are going to have something of a gullet, that primitive cytostome that allows food to be taken in, that is going to be digested within a vacuole using enzymatic activity, and then it's put into a membrane anal pore and put out into the environment. When we talk about the feeding living form, that is referred to as the vegetative form and is called a trophozoite. When it is in the kind of holding stage, which means that it is not metabolically active, the cyst form is for its survival during adverse conditions. The protozoa can reproduce both asexually and sexually. Asexual reproduction is by fission, budding, or schizogeny, where we'll see this rapid multiple fission. And here we see in the picture, the sexual reproduction of two paramecium engaging in conjugation they can actually pass genetic material one to the other via a tube that allows them to connect. We'll take a look at some of the medically important phyla of protozoa. Some that you may be familiar with, Giardia is the GI path pathogen. Trichomonas vaginalis is the STI, the sexually transmitted infection called the trick. The trypanosoma, the gambines here is going to be causative agent of sleeping sickness. And Leishmania is a disease that is transmitted by a sand fly in Middle Eastern countries. And this is going to, again, be a protozoan pathogen. So the naming of the groups for the protozoa has been the one that has had the most changes over time. We keep figuring out better ways, whether it is by molecular techniques classifying them by DNA or RNA to be able to put them in their appropriate phylogeny. So we'll talk about what are referred to as the parabasalids and the diplomonads, which were formerly in a group known as the archozoa. 
These got their name because these are unusual organisms and that they do not have a mitochondria. And so people initially thought these were organisms that were a transition organism, a primitive organism that didn't have a mitochondria. But if we examine these parasites, we see that they actually have a mitosome. So it's an area where the mitochondria were kind of remnants of it, but they don't have the functional mitochondria. That is a reason, one of the reasons that they may have lost their mitochondria is because of their, their parasitic lifestyle of being passed from host to host. The group, both the parabasalid and the diplomonids have multiple flagella. To the right-hand side, you see the trichomonas vaginella, vaginalis, the sexually transmitted disease. It does not have a cyst form, and that kind of makes sense because this is a disease that needs intimate contact to be able to be transmitted from host to host. The diplomonads get their name because they have two nuclei. One of the notable examples is Giardia lamblia, which is a nasty GI pathogen. But if you look at it underneath the microscope, it almost looks like a little face smiling back at you. It has this teardrop shape and flagella, and the two nuclei kind of look like these googly eyes looking back at you, and the cytostome actually almost looks like a mouth. So we see that the trophozoite form has a more teardrop shape to it. The cyst form, usually when things go into a cyst, they're going to be more rounded, and it'll possibly have more than two nuclei in the cyst form as well. These have been, have been put in a super kingdom referred to as the excavata. These are single-celled eukaryotes with a feeding groove, so it encompasses the diplomonads, the parabasalids, and the euglenozoa as seen here. The euglena here is an interesting organism that carries out photosynthesis, so it has chloroplasts, but if it finds itself in an environment without light, it will be able to be a chemoheterotroph to be able to survive. You see the eye spot to help it find the light, but interestingly, the cytostome is where the flagella is going to be um, coming from. So the flagella can also be used to cause debris and food to be kind of funneled by a vortex into that cytostome as well. So it can utilize a chemoheterotrophic lifestyle or a photosynthetic lifestyle, depending on the conditions of its environment. So the euglenozoa are going to move by flagella. So when you watch them underneath the microscope, they kind of have a more of a swimming torpedo effect to them. The true euglenozoa are going to be the ones seen in the previous slide that oftentimes are green underneath the microscope in our photoautotrophs. But from a pathogenic standpoint, we're more interested in what are referred to as hemoflagellates, which are blood parasites. The one in the top corner, we see that this is a trypanosoma. This is a wavy or undulating worm that you would find in the blood swimming around the red blood cells. It causes diseases like uh, African sleeping sickness, or Chagas disease down in South America. And these are transmitted by vectors. Things like um, the, the tsetse fly for the African variety and the rutavid bug for the South American variety. The Leishmania is going to be another flagellated form. In the smaller panel there, kind of looks a little bit cigar shaped with a flagella. This is transmitted by the sand fly in mostly Middle Eastern areas. There are three different types, visceral, cutaneous, and mucocutaneous. The visceral can be deadly because it's very destructive for tissue, but even in the cutaneous and mucocutaneous form, the ulcerations that are associated with the disease are very uh, graphic. Nigleria is another newer parasite that's associated with waters that we swim in. The form has both a flagellated form and an amoeboid form, but it has been a notable cause, but rare, for a meningoencephalitis that is fatal. 
So this has been in the news lately. A couple of summers ago, there was the report of a young 13-year-old girl that was killed by this brain-eating amoeba. She liked to water ski, and she spent most of her summer days doing that. Well, unfortunately, she contracted the organism. It has both the cyst and a flagellated form, but it also has a trophozoite form that is what is the infectious form. As you are in natural waters, you automatically, when swimming, take a little bit of water up the nose, and sometimes the parasite is able to go through the nasal passages and get to the brain, causing what is often a fatal meningoencephalitis, inflammation of both the meninges and encephalitis, meaning inflammation of the brain. The group that is easily identified by the name, the amoebae, has kind of had a few iterations of that name. They were first classified as the rhizopoda, then the amoebozoa, now the amoebae, but they are classified by the fact that they move by pseudopodia. So in the amoeba proteus scene as the free living form that you find out in the environment, you see the very prominent pseudopodia, and it's lots of fun to watch the amoeba kind of creep across the um, slide if you look at them underneath the microscope. Pathogenic forms, the most notable is Entamoeba histolytica. This is the causative agent of what's referred to as amoebic dysentery, which is a nasty, bloody diarrhea, very common down in South America. We see that in the picture here, the entamoeba has ingested some red blood cells, and you can also see the nucleus, but it doesn't usually have the pseudopodia as you see for the free living form. Again, a parasite usually is being moved around in its environment and it's in a place that's very uh, high nutrient based. And so it doesn't tend to be quite as modal. We do see that there's an interesting problem in trying to identify the parasite is 10% of humans may naturally be colonized by a non-pathogenic member that looks very similar to the Entamoeba histolytica. So finding it in a stool sample can be problematic. The true Entamoeba histolytica got its name because it has a galactose binding lectins that allow it to lyse open the intestinal cells, causing a lot of inflammation and the associated bloody diarrhea. Other free living amoebas that have been now found to be pathogens, the acanthamoeba can infect the cornea and cause blindness, and the Balamuthia in 1990 was found to be another organism that could cause encephalitis. In this case, it's referred to as a granulomatous amoebic encephalitis. The amoeba gets to the brain, and then you get white blood cells, granulocytes, trying to wall it off to encase it, and this turns into a granulomatis, which is kind of not anything malignant, but obviously this is causing a lot of um, damage to cells and tissues in the area and inflammation. We see down in the bottom panels what the entamoeba histolytica would look like underneath the microscope. So it's very hard to tell the difference between the trophozoa, which is a little bit more elongated, and the cyst is usually more rounded, but they're not exactly as um, graphic as what we think of as the free form, the amoeba proteus. AP complexa got their name because they have very complex life cycle, plus the fact they have an apical complex with enzymes that are released to help them penetrate into cells. These are non-modal and they are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to get from cell to cell and often transition from multiple hosts. Ones that you may be familiar with, Plasmodium is the causative agent of malaria. And in the 1980s, we found a new waterborne parasite, Cyclospora. This has been involved in epidemics not only of just drinking water, but most of the time we see when fruits and vegetables have been rinsed in waters contaminated with cyclospora, that that has been the cause for some notable outbreaks. 
If we look at malaria, malaria is one of the world's leading diseases, and this protozoan disease is one that actually infects into the red blood cells. The red blood cells go through a erythrocytic stage, and they time the release of the merozoites on a cycle of 24 hours. So that's why when you talk about one of the primary symptoms of malaria is the cyclic nature of the fever and chills. This always occurs on some multiple of 24, 24, 48, 72 hours, depending on the species of plasmodium. But the plasmodium is regulating its development according to slight fluctuations in our body temperature that ensures that the merozoites and gametocytes are going to be released from the red blood cells at dusk when the, the Anopheles mosquito is most likely to take its blood meal. If we look at the life cycle, we see the first thing that happens is that the mosquito is going to inject the sporozoites as it takes its blood meal. These actually first go into the liver cells and go through a rapid schizogeny to make merozoites that are then produced and go into infecting the red blood cells in the bloodstream. This then is going to go through the erythrocytic stage we see first a ring stage, then a trophozoite stage where it looks like a, um, a little amoeba inside. And then it goes through rapid schizogeny to make the merozoites. These merozoites, again, are released from the red blood cells at dusk. And some of these are male and female gametocytes. So then when the mosquito takes its blood meal, it is referred to as the definitive host. The definitive host is what has the sexually reproducing form, and as it then has the uniting of the male and female gametocytes, we see the formation of the diploid zygote. This then is going to result in the formation of the sporozoites. These travel to the salivary gland of the mosquito, and the life cycle continues. Humans are the intermediate host. Intermediate host just means those that have a developmental or larval form. It does not imply that one's host intermediate or definitive is worse or better, but we have the asexual reproducing form, which just means it's a larval form that is replicating, but no sexual reproduction. Other AP complexa that you may know, Toxoplasma gondii. This is the one that is associated with cats. Cats carry the organism and put out the cyst in their feces. People can then ingest, and it can infect red blood cells, but it has a wider range of cells that it can infect in the body. The most notable problem is that it can be the cause of congenital infections. It can get into the cells of the unborn fetus and either cause major damage or spontaneous um, or spontaneous miscarriages or stillbirths. Babsia looks a lot like malaria in its presentation, so cyclic fevers and chills. However, it has a tick vector. So when we're doing our differential diagnosis in the later chapters, all these things are going to be used to help you identify the potential disease and its causative agent. Another AP complexa, Cryptosporidium is becoming the leading cause of what's referred to as recreational water-associated gastroenteritis. That is because the organism is very chlorine resistant. Most of our pools are disinfected by chlorine. And this is also a very small organism. The organism has to be trapped in the filters Oftentimes, if there's problems with the filtration for pools, the organism can escape. This was a newly recognized parasite in 1993. Most healthy individuals probably do not get this, but in immunosuppressed individuals and AIDS patients, this can infect the re respiratory system, gallbladder infections, and is a major cause of death. But even in healthy individuals, this can sometimes cause a very nasty form of diarrhea, and we'll talk about this later in the GI chapter because the CDC has been warning during the summer of what have been referred to as pool party poopers because of the outbreaks of cryptosporidium that has been occurring each summer. 
The ciliophora or ciliates move by cilia. These are going to be cells like the paramecium in the vorticella seen on the right hand side. If we look at a paramecium, it's very obvious what the cytostome looks like. It literally looks like a, a mouth or this feeding gullet. Again, as it takes food in, it'll put that into a food vacuole to be digested. And you can see how that can then fuse with the cell membrane, creating an anal pore for release of the waste products. The Bellantidium coli is the only human parasite in this group. It causes a very severe but rare form of dysentery, so again, a bloody diarrhea. So we hear, see here in the diagram, the trophozoite has this interesting kind of butterfly nucleus to it, and it has kind of an elongated football shape. So it can infect both humans and livestock, especially pigs, as the organism is put out into the environment, it'll then make the cyst form so that it can survive outside of the host. But that's then the problem, especially in areas that don't have good san sanitation, you see exposure by that fecal oral route to continue the life cycle. As I said before, the taxonomy has changed drastically for the protozoa. The old taxonomy was based on motility. The new taxonomy is based on more sequencing and molecular techniques. So when we talk about these in the lab, you will hear people refer to the mastigophora, which are going to be protozoa that have flagella. So these are going to be things like the diplomonads, the parabasalids, and the euglenozoa. The sporozoa was the old name for those organisms that did not have locomotion. We now see that this is going to encompass mostly the AP complexa. The microspora, again, um, kind of was in this category, but we now know that this is a fungi, so we talked about that in the previous slide set. The ciliophora, fortunately, has stayed the same. They are now just referred to as the ciliates, but they have cilia and the other major change. The amoebae used to be referred to and sometimes still are functionally referred to as the sarcodyna. That is because with those pseudopodia, they have the streaming of their ectoplasm that allows them to push those false feet forward. So make sure that you go through and check your knowledge as always. So we see a variety of these protozoa found both in us and other animals. Most of them do no harm, but we do have a few notable pathogens that we will talk about in subsequent chapters. We also have the last of this of what's referred to as the slime molds. The slime molds are very interesting because they become interesting model organism for understanding multicellularity. These cellular slime molds pictured here send up a stalk with a fruiting body at the top, whereas the plasmodial slime molds kind of have this veiny looking appearance to them as they send out the ectoplasm in the streams to be able to grow and propagate. When we look at these slime molds, they get their name because they do look slimy out in the environment. They have both fungal and amoeba characteristics, and they're probably more closely related to the amoebas, which is why they're in this chapter, but we still retain the traditional name of calling them slime molds, kind of referring to that fungal feature as well. The cellular slime molds are typically eukaryotic cells that resemble truly amoebas and then aggregate together to form that, that stalk and fruiting body. The plasmodial slime molds exist as a mass of protoplasm with many nuclei kind of streaming through. These actually do move and pulsate. So in the 1970s, there was this article about this Dallas resident that found this pulsating red blob in his backyard and basically was convinced that this was alien life. And if you watch some of the videos of these slime molds, you could kind of understand where that might have come from. So if we compare the slime molds, the cellular slime molds resemble amoebas and they ingest bacteria by phagocytosis. They come together and form a stalked fruiting body, whereas the plasmodial slime molds, 
they are going to have their cytoplasm separates into stalk sporangia, and then they are going to put out haploid spores. But most of the time, they're going to end up being these multinucleated streaming large cells. I've included some links if you want to take a look at some videos and some examples. If we look, though, at their life cycle here for the cellular slime mold, you can see the amoeba comes together with a common cellular signal, cyclic AMP. Even in our own bodies, this is a common signaling molecule. It causes these amoebas literally to kind of march together and form an amoeba aggregate, which turns into this migrating slug. So imagine this pulsating slug, and that's why you can think about that people thought this was some alien life form. But eventually this slug stops, put up, puts up a stalk, and at the end there's going to be a fruiting body where the spore cap then is going to release spores out into the environment. Again, this is an interesting model organism in trying to understand signals for becoming multicellular. With the plasmodial slime molds, they start out with a multinucleate plasmodial form, and then they start to separate things and distribute their nutrients and such in these cytoplasmic streams. These then separate into separate groups of protoplasm, and they start to form sporangia on stalks. These spores will then develop in the sporangia, and these will then be released into the environment. The gametes germinate to form the, um, from these spores, and then you have the haploid gametes in the sexual reproducing portion of the life cycle coming together to form the zygote. That zygote then develops by nuclear divisions and leads back to the asexual reproducing form, that multinucleate plasmodial form. So check out the slime molds. They are very interesting just to watch and look at, but they are kind of a category all of their own, but put here with the protozoa because they are related, even though we refer, we refer to them as molds, it is a misnomer.